Christmas is almost upon us, and we wanted to fill the sanctuary with good songs and the, the flavor, the feeling of Christmas, because uh, with this coupled together with Easter, of course, is the, the most important events of the Christian faith. Everything swirls around these, and they're vitally important to us. And what we're looking at in our, our series this, this uh, Advent season is how the Advent story is real and gives a reality to the whole of our lives, that this should, doesn't always, but it should define our lives, the Advent Christmas message of what God has done and how he's come to us. And so again, we look at the Advent, the coming of Jesus, in the fullness of reality. What does this mean? What does it look like? How do we respond to it? What hope might we glean from this? How might it affect and change our lives? And so it's a lot of fun, and I'm grateful that Bruce gave me Joseph stories. I let him pick the sermon series this time, and, and he assigned me. I'm glad he didn't give me some obscure passage like I'm intending to give him for that hot air comment. <laughs> but I love Joseph. I, I just love Joseph. You know, Joseph never says a word in the Bible. The father of Jesus, not a single word, but his feet talk. What he does and what's said of him describes him as a very good man. The father of Jesus, God the father in heaven, picked a very good earthly father for Jesus. And we get to look at this man, Joseph, today. So listen to the text. It's from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. It begins at verse 18. Listen to this, and again, I want to challenge you. Listen to it as if you've never heard it before. We all have, but listen. Imagine the, the amazingness of the story. Imagine, picture the awkwardness of the situation, the reality that Mary and Joseph found themselves in with the announcement of a pregnancy. It should not have been there. And imagine... The fear, the anxiety, the questions. And what would you have done? Listen to the word of God. Now the birth of Jesus took place like this. Mary, his mother, who was engaged to Joseph, but long before she'd, they'd ever come together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph... He was a righteous man, and he had no desire to publicly humiliate her. So he decided that he would secretly divorce her. And after he had figured all of this out, look, an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. And the angel said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child that is conceived within her is from the Holy Spirit. And you will get to call his name Jesus because he is going to save his people from their sins. Now, all of this happened to fulfill the words that had been written long ago in the prophet where it says, look, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Well, when Joseph got up, woke up from his sleep, he did exactly as the angel had commanded him to do. And he took Mary as his wife, but he had no relations with her until after this child was born. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. What a great story. You know, there are so many things that you could know about Jesus. A lot of things I think you should know about Jesus. But it all comes down to two things you must know about Jesus. There's just two things. Everything else hangs off of these things. Everything that is in the Gospels, every story about what he did, every, every healing that he did and what it means, the Sermon on the Mount and what he's calling us to do and to be, his, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, filled with details. But there's two things, of all the things you can know, there's two things you must know about Jesus. 
And that is, quite simply, who he is and what he's done. What he does, what he's accomplished, and who he is in his reality. Everything hangs on this. And I love this passage, this simple little Joseph passage, because in this, in the words that are given to Joseph about what is happening, describe or answer, at least initially, who Jesus is and what he does. What he's come to accomplish and who it is that's accomplishing these things. So you have this account that Joseph is engaged to Mary. He was probably a bit older. She may have been as young as 14. You've heard at 14, maybe as old as 18, but pretty young. He was probably a little older because it was common for the husband to try and earn a little living, make a home, prepare a home. All those details are left out of the scriptures. We are just left to guess and ponder with what else we know. But it becomes clear to him, through her, no doubt, that she's pregnant. And you can imagine how difficult it would be. I mean, this was pre-science days. But they knew where babies came from. This was no surprise in the sense of where babies come from. And it would be just as hard for him as it would be for us to hear. If imagine your daughter coming and saying, yeah, I'm pregnant and it's from the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine that. Or if you were engaged to someone who said that to you. And what we don't really get the picture of is how scandalous this would have been on the, the big picture. Because not only was it just shameful for Mary, you could kind of see that. You could imagine that. It's not hard. You could take a leap that's a little bit bigger and imagine how scandalous and embarrassing it would be to her family. But the reality is it was a scandal to the whole village. This just didn't happen. It did not happen. Young teenage girls who were betrothed, who were engaged to someone, they did not get pregnant. And not only would this be a, just a scandal to her and a scandal, a shameful thing to her parents, the whole village would be tainted by it. The whole village would be known by the villages surrounding us. That's the village of Mary. And so this huge event lands on them. And what's intriguing, and I like this, and I appreciate this, is it doesn't just land on Mary. It'd be easy in maybe the Luke story that we read about this, and she says, how is this going to happen? And you see that it lands on Mary. But something like this, it didn't just land on Mary. It landed on her parents. It landed on the village. And it landed on Joseph. And it landed on him. And there was a lot going on there, not just of what it meant to him personally. And who is she? I thought we were getting married. What does this mean? Personal questions, relational questions with her come to mind. But then ethical questions. And ethical questions don't matter to everybody, but they clearly matter to Joseph. And it's intriguing. He says he had no desire to set her aside or, or to humiliate her publicly. It wasn't his intention to hurt her, and it could have been done. In fact, the penalty for what's occurred here is death. I mean, it's astonishing, isn't it? For a teenage girl outside of marriage, engaged to a man to become pregnant, the penalty was stoning. To be brought into the village or outside of the village and stoned to death. It's astonishing. And Joseph, you see his goodness, his good heart. He had no desire. It says not just to see her killed, but no desire to see her shamed. And clearly he thought about it a lot. There's two words that are used here in the Greek, and it means mulling it over pondering it, chewing it up, and wrestling with it, he had decided that he would secretly set her aside. He would secretly divorce her, is the word. Now, it must have been a hard decision. But in the end, it felt, as a righteous man, the only thing he could do to set her aside and divorce her. But that night, or one night, it doesn't really tell us the sequence, how long did he sit on this, it, but it does say that Greek word that it says that he had wrestled with this for a while, and having made this conclusion, it was then that the angel came. Sometimes God lets us sit in the ambiguity, doesn't he? There are a lot of times that our kids might be going through tough things, and the answer doesn't come just in an instant. 
There might be times in a marriage is going through tough times or relationships are going through really hard times and you pray and you wrestle and who knows how long dear Joseph wrestled with this and pondered over this and chewed on it and tried to determine the right things. Who knows how many prayers he said over what amount of time, shorter or longer. But the, the word is clear that he thought about it a lot and one night when he was asleep, the angel of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Now, one of the things I love in this text, it says a little bit later that when he woke up, when he got up, Joseph did everything that the angel commanded. But in Greek, a command is always spelled a certain way. You can tell it's a command because it has a certain spelling. And there's not a single command given in this passage from the angel. He's told, it says that he got up and did as the angel commanded, but the reality is the angel did nothing but give Joseph facts. He did nothing. And the only thing in addition to some facts was a comforting word. He says, don't be afraid. But even that doesn't take the form of a command. It's like a suggestion. It's like, you don't need to be afraid, Joseph. There's something bigger going on. There's something great going on. Not a single command. And it speaks highly again of Joseph that he doesn't need to be coerced into doing the right thing. He doesn't have to be armed with his arm behind his back by the angel doing the right thing. It makes me think, how quick am I to do what God wants me to do? Do I have to hear the command over and over and over and over? Or am I quick to just have a suggestion? To hear what the right thing is to do and to leap for it. And that's what Joseph does. He leaps for the right thing to do, to do the right thing. And he, 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 this beautiful dream is given in two descriptions. The two things we need to know about Jesus are given. The first is, what does he do? Now, the word Jesus, it's a common name back in those days. Jesus is very common. And it's the Greek version of, and you probably know this, of Joshua, Yeshua. Yeshua, or Joshua, means Yahweh, which is often translated in our Bibles as the Lord. But Yahweh saves. Yeshua, or may the Lord save. Or Lord, it could even be command kind of a sense. Lord, save us. But Jesus means Yahweh saves. God saves. The Lord saves his people. There's a bunch in this. It's good. First of all, saves who? His people. He doesn't look at us as aliens and outsiders, lost, worthless, and unworthy. He looks at us as precious and beloved. He looks at us as his people. When you have someone that's your people, your family, you you tend to give a lot of energy to them. You might give them more of a benefit of the doubt. You might give them more of a grace. You might give them more effort. And this label that he came to save his people shows the heart of God for us, that we're his people. He's going to give us extra. He's going to race after us. He's going to work for us because we're precious to him. He loves us. He wants to see that good comes to us. So he says, you will call his name Jesus, which means God saves, for he will save his people from their sins. Sin is a a mysterious thing, and we've looked at it through all the years. I've been here in multiple ways. Sin is three basic things. It's something that's down. It's something we do. It's just something we do. We we lie. We cheat. We we, we sin. That's the acts that are wrong against God's will. But it's not only that. It's something that in doing those things, it's something that we become. That when you lie repeatedly over and over, over a long period of time, you become a liar. If you cheat repeatedly over a long period of time, you become a cheater. Sin is not only what we do, it's what we become. But the Bible has a third meaning of sin, and it's, it's deep, and it's way beyond anything that we can look at today, but something that's even outside of us, something that controls us, something that seeks to own us. But the bottom line of it is sin comes into our lives, and it messes our lives up. It estranges us from God destroys the relationship we have with God, and it destroys relationships with one another. You can look at it in a lot of different ways. You can say sin, sin finds us. 
None of us is immune from it. It finds us. It seeks us out. It looks for us, and it will grab us. It will work to grab us. How does it work? I don't understand. It seems so often there's something inside of me that's just in full agreement with it and wants to participate in it. What is that? Sin is so powerful, it sometimes feels like a voice from outside pulling us into junk we shouldn't do, we know we shouldn't do. Sometimes it feels like a voice from inside that's our very character pulling us into stuff we don't want to do. But it finds us, and no one is immune to it. It grinds us. It just grinds our lives. You think of coffee grinders. You put in whole beans, and you push the button, and it comes out pulverized. And that's what sin does to our lives. It grinds our lives up. It grinds our relationships up. It breaks things. It grinds us. It blinds us. It blinds us to the truth, the truth of who we are and the truth about who God is. It blinds us into thinking that we're really not all that bad and everybody does it and we don't have that big a problem. I could quit any time I want and on and on we go. It blinds us into thinking that God hates me and I'm so bad and nothing will change and nothing gets get fixed. We get so twisted in our thinking and our understanding it it, it finds us it grinds us it blinds us it minds us it controls us in a weird and mysterious way but you see the great news of this is that jesus came to save us from this he came to rescue us from this and all that follows in the rest of the gospel of matthew is a story of how he did that He did it through his teaching, of course, and the Sermon on the Mountain and his miracles. But what he did most is dying for our sin on the cross, that there he put it to death, that his life might be put into our broken lives and made new. And that our sin that made those lives broken might be put onto him where it's dealt with finally and permanently. Jesus saves us. And so the first thing that we learn is who is Jesus or what does he do? What does Jesus do? He saves his people from their sin. The second thing to know, and it's in this passage, it says, this is all to fulfill the word of the prophet Isaiah. Look, it doesn't actually say Isaiah, but through the prophet, that the words of the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. All this is from the prophet Isaiah, and it's looking forward, and this is the, the nickname, you might say, of the one who is going to come. Who is it that saves us from our sins? It's God. That Jesus, what happens in him, what is given to us in him, is something unlike anything the world has to give, offer, provide, or pronounce. It is a story of God coming into this world to people who weren't looking and who weren't deserving and who didn't want it and who didn't understand it and who were in the grinding and blinding and minding and binding of sin. He came himself to set things right. He is God with us. Now, when you think about it, in fact, this is the way that we have to think about it, that we must think about it. The coming of Jesus is unprecedented. And that means not just that nothing like it's happened before or nothing like it's happened since, It means that, but means more. It means that what happened is nothing on earth pulled God down. Nothing twisted his arm to get him to act in this way. What he did is entirely his own act, an act of grace. It's not something that we ever could have deserved or even desired. It's something he, in answer to our deepest needs, did on his own volition, from his own will, from his own love to set things right. And the way that he did it is not by sending a human savior or a teacher or a coach, but coming himself to deal with the problem of human sin at the human level as a man. It is astonishingly mysterious and amazing and miraculous It's beyond human description. It's beyond our ability to grasp what what has happened in these simple little words. That God saves. And this God who saves does it by becoming one of us and dwelling among us. And doing what needs to be done from the very midst of us that we might be set right with God. So it answers the question, what does Jesus do? Well, he comes to make his people free. He comes to take away our sin. 
He comes to deal with it and make us whole and make us new. And who is he? He's God. This one who is taking away the sin of the world, the sin of his people, is God himself. What he does and who he is is everything to understanding the rest of the story. And what's fun is we close with this. The rest of the story, all the the chapters between this chapter 1 and the end, chapter 28, are filled with Jesus teaching, preaching, healing, and ultimately at the very end, the cross and the resurrection. But the very last words of Jesus, the very last things that he says in the Gospel of Matthew to his disciples are, I think, in Matthew's intention to be a bookend, you might say, the beginning and the end, to couple with these verses so that we have at the very beginning of the gospel these words of who Jesus is and at the very end a reminder of it. For at the very end of the gospel, you remember those great words, you know, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples teaching everything I've told you. And he says, look, I am with you. This is the way that Greek is translated exactly word for word. Look, I with you, I am, all the days until the completion of the age. Greek puts an overemphasis on it, saying, I with you, I am. Here you have at the very beginning, God with us. God saying, I will be with you. I will dwell with you. If we remember the story when we look back in all the different places where it spoke of God making a promise that he would dwell among us, that we would be his people, that he would make his dwelling place among his people. Here you have at the promised birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God who is with us. And when the whole story of Jesus is finished, Jesus' last words to his disciples, he says, look, I am with you. I, I am am with you and even until the end of the age this is the Christmas story is that God saw our brokenness didn't hold us at arm's length but came into the midst and the grit of our lives to make us whole and this one who made us whole the one who came to save us is God himself that he would dwell among us and we can have a relationship with him this is Christmas and this is why There's every reason to celebrate it. This is why we go all out every Christmas season because of how good and special and joyous this message is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for how much you love us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your your word that goes out. Thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for Joseph and the good man that he was, that you coached him and led him through the years before this to make him to that man that would do the right thing. We thank you, Lord. And we ask your blessing upon us that we would be righteous like him, that we would seek the good of others, that we would bring the good of Jesus into this hurting and dark world. And we thank you, Lord, for how much you love us and that you desire to be among us. We thank you that you have taken away our sin. We thank you that you are God with us. We worship you. Amen.